Hey there, it's November 24th, and this is the Weekly News Recap here on Ball Prey Real Estate. My name's Matthew Pfeiffer, residential real estate agent in Regina, and normally my trusted assistant, Matilda, would be sitting right there, but she's been enjoying the day at Doggy Daycare with all of her friends. So, this week, it's been a relatively busy one, but more than anything, we're talking about inflation and the fall economic statement from the federal government, because there was a lot of housing initiative stuff in there. So let's dive deep into it after this terrible bad dad joke. Why did the sad ghost take the elevator? To raise his spirits. If you have a terrible joke, put it in the comments below. Let's get into this week's real estate news. First, I've got to answer the poll question for you guys that I put out earlier this week. And the question was, which age demographic has the highest delinquency rate on their mortgages in Canada? And unsurprisingly to me, most of you, 44%, answered that it was those in that 25 to 34 year old category and you would all be wrong. The highest delinquency rate is among those that are 65 or older. That actually really surprised me, but I have an explanation for it. The lowest delinquency rate was actually that 25 to 34. Those that are 65 plus had a delinquency rate of 0.2. That would be higher than the 0.15 that we're seeing kind of nationally and across the board. And the younger age group, millennials, that was 0.12. So they actually have a lower delinquency rate than most Canadians. And here's why I think that's true. Although those that are 65 and older probably have smaller mortgages, they have less ability to go generate more income than somebody that is in that 25 to 34 year old category. Probably is a little bit easier for them to go out and pick up a second job and generate more income. Next up, let's talk about a report from Scotiabank out of the Financial Post talking about how much of an impact government spending has had on the interest rate hikes we have seen recently. It was in late 2021 or very early into early 2022 that the Bank of Nova Scotia put out a forecast saying they felt that, that year the Bank of Canada was going to raise interest rates 200 basis points or 2%. And everybody said that is ridiculous. The Bank of Canada is gonna never raise interest rates that much. They'll break something if they do. And here we are 500 basis points later and things well, it's been tough on a lot of people and we are starting to see how much of an impact those higher interest rates are having across the economy. We saw it almost immediately in the real estate market how quickly things changed as interest rates started to increase. They're out with a new report looking at what part of the government spending has caused the inflation to go up and how much of that has resulted in higher interest rates. So what they're saying is that of the 500 basis point hikes the Bank of Canada has had to do, 200 of that is because of the government of Canada's spending putting upward pressure on inflation. The more money you put into the economy, the more inflation you're going to have. And Tiff Macklin has been starting to kind of talk about this a little bit, very tippy-toed. It was two meetings ago, basically said that the government spending is making their job a lot harder. Yeah, the government has to rein in spending. They don't seem to want to do that, fall economic update another 40 billion dollar deficit that's going to continue to put upward pressure so instead of five and a half to six and a half percent interest rates today we would likely have somewhere they have above three and a half to four and a half percent rates if it wasn't for all the money that the government has been spending now let's talk about the fall economic update and how it's going to impact housing and residential real estate in canada okay so this is going to be a long one i've got a pile of notes here and that's gonna be the majority of this video here. So buckle up, let's get into it. Starting off with short-term rentals. What's going on there? What the government is doing because property rights and real estate are regulated provincially. So the government of Canada can't really do anything directly to change Airbnb short-term rental rules. But what they've done is kind of found an end way around it. And that's through the tax code. What they are doing is they're going to go after or not allow people who have short-term rentals in cities that have existing prohibitions on short-term rentals or where short-term rentals don't meet certain regulation requirements, then those owners will not be allowed to claim tax exemptions. So quick rundown on exactly what this is so you guys understand. And we're just gonna kind of use some rough numbers here. When someone is got a business, now this is all businesses, not just short-term rentals, but any 
expenses you incur to generate revenue. So if you're a store owner, the expenses you have to create that revenue, it can be used as a tax write off. Again, I'm not an accountant here. Please don't take this as financial advice, but this is the general rule. So when a short term rental owner has expenses like having the property cleaned or having to do renovations, repairs, etc., they can claim those expenses and it reduces their total income that they're taxed on. So if they have $100,000 in income from those short term rentals, and they have say $50,000 in expenses to generate that revenue, then the taxable income is $50,000. So that's kind of the way that works here. Again, not financial advice. What the government's doing is saying, no longer if you have a short-term rental in a city that has a prohibition on short-term rentals, can you claim that tax exemption or that tax write-off? So now you're gonna be taxed on the full $100,000. What they're trying to do is run Airbnb owners out of business. Now, what I'm really curious about is when this water starts getting a little bit muddy because, okay, maybe Vancouver has a prohibition on short term rentals. And what if they have them in, say, one area, but not another? This could get really messy really quickly. There's approximately 100,000 short term rentals in Canada. That's the best estimates I could find. Of course, they're not evenly distributed across the country but the government wants to see more of these converted back into long-term rentals or be sold outright so people can look to purchase them. The, again, the exemptions are those uh, cities that already have prohibitions or regulations that the short-term rentals don't meet those regulations. The exemptions as well for this are as somebody that has a Airbnb short-term rental in their primary residence, they could still continue to claim these tax write-offs. So that's a quick rundown on what they're doing with short-term rentals. Now let's get into the housing accelerator fund because the government is using this fund to try to see more homes getting built. They want to see about 100,000 houses getting built over the next five years. Not many houses have been built under this housing accelerator fund to date, and they're throwing more money at it. But all of these promises, basically all of them in the fall economic update, do not kick in until the year 2025 or 2026, conveniently after an election, and kick in the can down the road so they don't run a higher deficit. This housing accelerator fund, these funds are not grants to get houses built. The government's not paying to get a house built. They're providing loans for all intents and purposes. A large percentage of this is also being run through CMHC where people can get some really favorable loan terms to get purpose-built rentals. Again, I like seeing more houses being built. 100,000 houses is nothing to sneeze at, but over five years, we're talking really, you know, 20,000, 25,000 houses per year in a country where we build 250,000 houses a year. So less than a 10% increase in the housing stock with this housing accelerator fund. And we are short, you know, well over a million and a half houses, you know, close to 2 million today and CMHE is projecting that by 2030 we're going to be short three and a half million houses again love seeing more houses getting built but this is not enough right now they also reaffirmed for the GST not being charged on purpose built rentals and they've extended it to co-op builds so this is kind of two small niches where GST is no longer going to apply great I'm happy with that less taxes on new construction I'm happier I wish this applied to all residential construction and not just small little bits of it. The government also provided some clarification on the stress test. Quick rundown on the stress test. Anybody who is applying for a mortgage has to qualify at the qualification rate, which is changed every single year. It's 5.25% right now, or 2% higher than the quoted rate you have. So nobody's qualifying at 5.25, or is qualifying at 2% higher right now than your quoted rate. The idea behind that was that then people would have to qualify at a higher rate. So if rates go up from where they're at, they should be in the financial position to make those higher mortgage payments. We're seeing some of that right now. We haven't seen a significant amount of delinquencies. There's also, of course, extended amortizations that's partly playing into that, but that doesn't apply to anybody who's renewing that's been on a fixed mortgage. So always, at least this is what everybody kind of thought, and I was one of those, Everybody who was renewing a mortgage and going to a different lender had to stress test if they went to a different lender, but not if they went with their existing lender. That was pretty much everybody was telling. Well, it turns out that was never actually true. And the government's clarifying saying that while they had a basically regime in saying the banks should do that, they don't have to do that. And now they're saying, please don't stress test everybody that's going to a different lender. So quick and dirty, 
If you're going to a new lender, you do not have to stress test. The lender may choose to apply the stress test though. Another thing is that the government says they're going to prioritize those that have construction backgrounds for permanent resident applications. Again, the government has been saying for a while now that they're going to keep immigration at the high levels they're currently at, but they're going to have the people that are coming to Canada also build the houses that they're going to need to live in. I'm not really sure how that's going to work out, but they're going to prioritize those in construction fields that want to come to Canada. The last piece of this fall economic update is the mortgage charter. Does this sound awfully similar to the home buyer bill of rights that was promised a couple of years ago? What happened to that? Oh yeah, absolutely nothing. Exactly what I said. And I expect this is going to be a whole lot more hot air as well. They're essentially saying they're going to make the banks promise to do a couple of things short-term temporary lengthening of amortizations to keep payments smaller for people. They're going to allow people to not have to pay. We're going to say to the banks, please don't charge people fees when they're renegotiating their mortgage or renewing their mortgage and allow people to go to different banks and not have to stress test. And if people have extenuating circumstances, you know, we're going to have payment holds, et cetera, et cetera. Pinky promise, please banks do this for us. Yeah. This is something that's just going to be a whole lot of hot air. Government's going to pump their fists about all. They're going to beat up on the big banks and make it easier for everyday Canadians. Well, guess what? The banks are already doing all of the things they talked about in this quote unquote charter. They will allow people to have these uh, short term extensions. We've already seen it with amortizations. They'll allow people to reduce fees, etc. At the end of the day, the banks don't want to foreclose on people's houses. They want people in their houses paying their mortgages. That's better for the banks. And I'm actually working on a video on foreclosures. I know I've been saying that for a while. I'm going to be talking about the differences between the foreclosure process and power of sale. A lot of times people use those interchangeably and they're absolutely not the same thing at all. So make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss that video when it comes out. But when it comes to this mortgage charter, much like the Home Buyer Bill of Rights, a whole lot of talk, not a lot of action. And I bet you this is going to just disappear, just like the Home Buyer Bill of Rights does after a couple of weeks, the government talking about it. And if that fall economic outlook has got you super excited to buy a house, well, if you're in Regina, I'd love to help you out. And when Matilda's back, she'll come along for the showings. But if you're anywhere else in Canada, don't worry, I can help you out because I've got a great network of real estate agents across the country and I can get you paired up with a great agent in your market if you don't already have one. In the description of this video, there's gonna be a link to my calendar. You can book me in and I will get you set up with that perfect agent. Next, you should check out this playlist right here, which is my first time home buyer playlist. Gonna answer all the questions you have about buying a house in Canada. If you like this video, please give this video a like. Hit the subscribe button if you like keeping up to date on the Canadian real estate market. Leave me some comments below so we can chat in the comments section. And as always, thanks very much for watching.